Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Better Tank a Dungeon series with Recognizant. Uh, in today's episode, we're going to be running through the dungeon called Sastasha. I have my group pre-assembled. This is a bunch of people who are going to be helping me out. Uh, in all, um, in all generally measured ways, except for the actual level, um, I am actually currently running as a uh, level 15 gladiator. It's a fresh uh, 15 gladiator. My uh, attribute points have been assigned, but they've been synced down, so I'll have like three or four more um, vitality points than most people who are going to be going through this if you're going through level 15. But all of my gear has been purchased by uh, going to the main markets in Limsa Lominsa and Ulda, and you could buy the dagger from the arms dealer in Ulda, or if you're a marauder, you can buy the iron axe from the, uh, which is also a level 15 weapon, from the vendor in Limsa Lamensa. The rest of the gear, uh, the Battlecraft gear, uh, you purchase the bronze outfit primarily. Um, it's the one that says Gladiator, Marauder, Paladin, Warrior on it. It offers the highest defense and magic defense. It's generally considered tank gear. You can't purchase a belt for it though. So I just have the hard leather hunting belt. Ideally, you're really prioritizing vitality over everything else. When you're, uh, when you're shopping. But right now, there's no Vitality accessories available at level 15, uh, unless you have some certain uh, collector's items or imports. So if you don't have any Vitality items, that's fine. Just go with your standard strength gear that you can buy off of the jewelers and the, uh, uh, the bronze shield you can purchase. I know at the very least you can purchase it from the vendor at Limsa Lamensa, which is where Sastasha takes place anyways. So you you just walked right past the, the big Aetherite in the lower Lamensa docks, and you, you could pick this up um, from there. It costs about 6.5 thousand gil or so for the whole group, and, um, and, and, and that will help us um, continue on and, and do the best job that we possibly can. I'm going at this from the perspective of somebody who just got here, but who has a group with them who's all been synced down. And so they'll have really, really high levels, lots of damage for me to deal with, and I'm going to show you what you can do to, to help, still help you be successful, hold aggro, and beat the dungeon at the end. Um, I want to introduce an, an extra companion. They're not in my primary list here. This is called, uh, this is a fairy, it's a healing fairy. There's an Aos and Selene, there's two different versions. The primary difference between them isn't super important for tanks at this level. Uh, Aos is a little bit better at healing, Selene's a little bit better at support. Aos will tend to draw a little bit more aggro, and that's the most important part. Everything about tanking in this game revolves around aggro. There will be an aggro list on the left side over here anytime I pull a group of enemies. Or, in a boss fight, when new enemies spawn, they will automatically be added to my aggro list. I will also have an aggro list up here uh, showing the order that a, a specific targeted mob uh, is currently listing their aggro table at. The person with the full aggro bar and the A beside their name will be the person who has aggro. Two, three, and four in any order below that is going to be the order of people who um, have the rest of the mobs. And if we... Walk past the hilariously posing monk here. Um, we'll go ahead and pull our first two bats. Now, if you haven't before doing Sastasha, I recommend picking up Shield Lob. Shield Lob is an ability that allows you to pull people from range, and it generates a lot more aggro than just walking up to somebody initially. It's really easy to lose aggro if you face if you face pull, uh, which is a term that says that I walked up and, and I got within range of them, and they saw me, and then they pulled onto me. Um, that only A face pull only gives you an aggro of like one or two, which means the first time anybody does anything else, they're going to pull all the mobs off of you, unless you hit them with flash or some other move before then. Um, so Shield Lob allows me to pull at least one of the enemies with an additional uh, threat uh, lead at the very start, um, and then once they're grouped around me, I'll be using flash. That's the standard tactic for pulling. You'll be seeing it throughout the entire dungeon. I'll go over it again just a couple more times. Uh, verbally, rather than walking it through uh, in the process, but I want you to be able to keep a look, uh, keep a lookout for that. So the first two mobs are these two black bats. Uh, if you look in your main commands menu here, you can go down. I'm repeating myself a little bit from the intro video if you haven't seen it, but I want to make sure everybody's aware since Sastash is the first dungeon people are going to be tanking. Um, signs and waymarks are both available here. They're both extremely useful. Waymarks allow you to to select a piece of ground and to target that with a, an indicator. 
Um, and signs allow you to mark an enemy with individuals. You can just drag and drop these down to your bar if you want. I already have both of them down here, so I'm going to remove that one that I just pulled down. But um, that, that's certainly an option if you would like to do that. Just make sure that your hotbar is not unlocked in order to add additional things to it. Um, you can just click this if you want and it'll lock and unlock. Now I'm going to go ahead and go down and we're going to go ahead and start. I'm going to let them every I'm going to let my team know that we're about to start. And I'm going to correct grammar because that's how I roll. And then we're going to run up here. And I'm going to going to open up with a shield lob ability on this black bat. We're going to use signs. Mark the black bat as one. It's assumed that the other one is going to be marked two if there's only two mobs in the pole. But to be extra sure, we can mark that as a two as well. And then we will hit shift two, which is my shield lob button. And when they group, I will hit shift three, which is my flash button. And I'm actually going to flash two or three times here to pull aggro. Above my head is my health bar. It's also listed over here on the side. After I've pulled aggro, I'm going to be alternating between fast blade and savage blade. As long as I have aggro, which is to say as long as these bars are, as long as my bar is the full one and these are um, not currently overtaking me, um, then we'll be absolutely fine in everything we're doing. The it, Holding aggro or not is a relatively binary uh, situation. More mobs. I pulled them on accident. We're going to use flash to grab aggro. And the one that was just hit, we're going to just assume that that's my number one mark. Everybody is going to def naturally default to that. I'm going to click over and use uh, fast blade and savage blade a little on the other one. On the other one, pop a flash because healers will have aggroed onto this one as well. So Aos, who's back here healing, uh, if I had left the other bat alone, that other bat would have eventually gone to Aos, and it would have been, um, it would have aggroed onto the other enemy, and I would have needed to chase it down to get that aggro back. If you right-click the bloody mem memo, uh, down here at the bottom you'll have a clue to a later part of the dungeon. The uh, captain likes his seas blue. Excellent. Excellent. Who doesn't love blue seas? So we have um, a cave Aurelia and two black bats. Cave Aurelias are slightly different than black bats in that they have a ground targeted attack, which I'll be pointing out. We're going to open up with shield lob after marking them. We're going to mark the black bats first and then the cave Aurelia last. And the reason that I'm going to do that is just so I can show you the way that the ground markers actually look in the game and what to avoid and how to avoid it. So we're going to grab it with a shield lob. We're going to wait till everything groups, and we're going to use some flashes. Whatever key you have, a flash is fine. Um, everybody's hot bar will be a little bit different than mine. Now, we're just going to spam flash a few times and kind of bait this, uh, this jellyfish into doing what it wants to do. Um, so... When it finally decides to use it, oh, my jellyfish, you can do it. You're my jellyfish, my jellyfish friend. Oh, there it is. That's a ground targeted mark. And there will also be a cast bar at the top, which I didn't see because I picked that exact moment to tab away to collect the other bat from the monk before it stole the aggro again. Um, but that's what the ground marker looks like. There's two cave rallies up here. We'll see it again. Just like before, we'll mark one and two. You can also drag the uh, actual marks over to your hotbar if you prefer that method. Um, I actually like having the flexibility of being able to open up the entire signs marker, um, but uh, different people have different styles of how they want to handle that. Um, I, I like having all of the signs available to me, and if I just pull over one, it won't necessarily work. My monk has accidentally pulled, so I'll go ahead and flash those guys back. And we'll hold them, and they're marked 1 and 2, so we're going to go ahead and tar target them like they're 1 and 2. The two flashes I just did will probably hold off on any healing that's going to be coming my way. There's the cast bar right there, numbing tendrils. You'll notice that the animation for the attack doesn't start until after the cast bar has finished. The animation is just there to be pretty, and it's not mechanically important. So I can step out, and as soon as that's gone, I can step back in, and despite standing in front of it for the animation, I didn't take any additional damage from that. It's completely safe to step into something after it has fired. Um, and that will hold true for the entirety of the game as well. 
Uh, we're going to come up here to this next area. We're going to veer slightly to the right and show you a bunch of Shade Seekers. These are really low-level enemies for the level of the dungeon. This is a level 15 dungeon. Most enemies are level 15. Uh, I'm going to mark the Giant Clam as the primary target, but the Clam itself doesn't actually attack here. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to walk up and I'm going to flash all of the Shades together and any more Shade Seekers that spawn in order to make sure everything is okay. We just grab this treasure chest unmolested over here. And we'll pull this aggro. Just walk up to it and flash. The mark itself over here doesn't actually matter. As long as we're holding the shades, we're pretty much all good. The black mage is taking care of the mobs while we're holding them. Uh, the paladin doesn't really... Gladiator. Gladiator doesn't really have any large AoE attacking abilities. It merely has flash to collect aggro. It doesn't actually deal any damage. So because it doesn't actually deal any damage, um, AoEs are best left to other people who have them. If nobody does have them, if you don't have a bard or a, uh, a black mage or a thaumaturge or anybody else who has AoEs, then you just kind of stand there and use fast blade and savage blade to kill them all. It takes a while, but um, you'll eventually swap them all down. They, they die in like two hits. They're kind of weak little flies. Uh, we actually want the fossil shell, which hits a little bit harder than the... Uh, than the jellyfish to be hit. If you're uncomfortable with dodging other attacks, then you may want to focus the uh, the cave Aurelia first. But I'm pretty good at dodging attacks at this point. It, the attack is rectangular, so the easiest way to dodge the jellyfish attack is to step out to the side. We'll go ahead and flash again after a couple combos just to make sure that we're continuing to hold aggro. We target the main target and start attacking it. And if it attacks us again, the easiest way to dodge is by stepping left or right, which is by default Q and E. Because it's a rectangular attack and it's pointed towards you, um, the, the best dodging direction will generally be the shortest way out, which in a rectangular attack is going to be the left or the right. A circular attack is going to be any straight line. That's just simple geometry. I don't think that works. We're going to grab the flashing... Shade Seekers once again. And just attack the Giant Clam. We had marked it last time. It's pretty. Uh, it's a pretty safe assumption that people know to attack the Giant Clam. If they don't, if they're not, uh, if there's other people who are new to the dungeon as well, go ahead and, and, and let them know why you're marking it first. Um, or you can continue to mark them each individual time. Honestly, you could probably even use the waymarks if you really wanted to. Uh, I'm going to mark the Fossil Shells. One and two. I will target one and hit it with a shield lob. You can give conflicting signals uh, if your first attack for damage is done based on um, is done that isn't the first marked mob. A lot of people are a little torn sometimes on whether they attack the first damage mob. This guy got away from me, so he's going to be gray in my window. The up arrow means I'm slightly catching up on aggro. The down arrow, like this means that I almost have aggro, and the square means I have aggro back. That's the way that it looks as you slowly regain aggro. The enemy list will show a group of people, and it takes a couple seconds to update. So the mob might leave while you're still on the square, but shortly after they reach their destination, you'll see it downgrade to whatever aggro uh, amount you're currently holding on. We'll again mark the giant clam as we're pulling aggro. We want to make sure not to step out too far. That fossil shell might see us which would be no good. That would be a lot of extra damage for the healers to fix, and uh, the healers can't always easily fix lots of damage, uh, depending on their own gear level and experience. So this is kind of a unique pull in the dungeon. It's the only one like it, I think. Uh, there's a Cave Aurelia, a Sastasha Orban, and a Fossil Shell, all in the same group. We're going to actually just pick a random order. I'm going to pick... Fossil Shell first, because I'm pretty sure they deal more damage. The Orban second, and the Cave Aurelia third. If you mouse over the enemy, you can see the lines going between them. Between this enemy and the Cave Aurelia. The Cave Aurelia, the Sastasha, and the Fossil Shell. And the way that those all link together, it's a little hard to see when they're that far away. When they're closer, it's much easier, because the, the Shade Seekers are kind of getting in, in, in trouble. You can see the lines going between the Shade Seekers there. But that means that when you pull one mob, you're going to pull the whole group. Even though the Cave Aurelia is all the way out here, I'm still going to pull it when I shield lob on this fossil shell. So it, as soon as I hit shield lob, you'll see it appear in my enemy list. 
And it'll probably have a very small amount of aggro. And I might even get healed before it first gets here. It just got here. And I'm about to be healed. Okay, I'm healed. And now you see that I lost aggro on it because I hadn't established extra aggro. The monk is going to town off target, which is Sastasha Orban. So I'll need to fight to catch that back up. I didn't get it in time, but I did help kill it, which made it easier for the, the healer to hold to keep track of the mob the entire time. Then I'm gonna go over here and I have to catch up back up on the cave Aurelia. This is my uh, this is my team making extra sure that I'm kept on my toes the entire time. Now if you don't if you don't want to worry about whether or not somebody's actually pulling aggro or not, you can just flash more often. If as soon as I pull a group, I flash three or four times, they'll probably never end up with a mob. We'll go ahead and mark this just for that. I think at this point Ari is aware that she needs to be attacking the giant clam. But if not, that will help. Treasure chests are great when you're on level. When you're really high level running stuff again, it may not be the best uh, idea to pick them up. It's kind of trash that sells for a couple of gil. But when you're leveling, they're useful items. You can get potions and ethers, and those can actually be used on this on-level content to make things easier. We have a very large group of Shade Seekers with us here. They're the only ones that are dealing damage again. The Clam summons more of them, so it's important to kill the Clam. But it's also important to kill the Shade Seekers because they continue to deal damage to you the entire time. If I don't pick up the Shade Seekers, if I just aggro the Clam, and I'll just fight the clam. Then when the healer starts topping me off, or the black mage starts attacking, you'll see their their attacks will turn to other targets, and they'll start attacking the uh, more vulnerable um, black mage or healer. Which in this case is Aos, since the scholar is mostly using other abilities. This is the blue coral formation, which is the one that we should be hitting, because if you recall, the captain likes his seas blue. If we hit a green or a red coral formation, and I'm colorblind, so those were reversed, we hit a red or a green coral formation, then it will spawn a different ad. Uh, so this is what happens if you press the wrong switch. It's just one little ad. It's not a big deal. It poisons me for a minute, which will take a long time, assuming the healer doesn't have a Suna, uh, which, as a scholar, they will not have at this point. They won't have any ability to get rid of uh, anything like that. You'll notice that, that these guys, I'm using Fast Blade and Savage Blade, and they're nearly catching up with me, if not surpassing me in damage. So when you're fighting a really large enemy, it's going to be something to keep in mind. So when I hit the blue, it unlocks a switch. The instant that I try to activate the switch, a boss will appear in the middle that we'll need to fight. So I'm going to activate the switch. There's the boss. It uh, presents the uh, the message that the Kateri will be sealed off in 15 seconds. And I will attempt to hold this boss as aggro against this monk, which, as you can see, is having a pretty easy time out damaging me. The Black Mage is too. There's a, there's a way around that. I can use Fight or Flight, which increases my damage by 30%. It also increases my aggro generation by 30%. And you'll notice that I start to maintain a very slight lead over the other two people in my group here. It's not a great lead, but it's a tiny one, and it's enough to hold over. Now, if we don't have fight or flight, using flash actually generates more single target enmity than using fast blade and savage blade, but it doesn't deal any damage. So if you can avoid it, uh, if you can avoid using only flash, it'll probably help get through the, the fights faster. This is a plundered jacket. If this was a tank item, then need would be available to me. It's not... It's a general um, a Disciple of War item, so it's designed for archers, uh, pugilists, and lancers primarily. Marauders and warriors can wear it, but you'll notice that I would get less defense wearing this item. A defense minus 10 in parentheses is compared to the current item that I'm wearing. So that's actually a downgrade in the amount of defense I have, so I'm going to pass on it since it's not for my class. Uh, if I had a class who could use it, then Greed would be a viable option. But as I currently stand, I don't need it, so I will press the Pass button, which will automatically default my roll to a zero. Once everybody has rolled, it will uh, show everybody's rolls. Needs automatically trump Greeds, and the person with the highest roll will be uh, 
the we'll have their inventory we'll have the object placed within their inventory. If I hit that inconspicuous switch, which was actually pretty conspicuous, it was glowing, um, then it opens the hidden door and that leads us to our second area. Now we find in the second area a patrol. Now this is this is a patrol, it's a group of enemies who walk back and forth. There's several ways of dealing with patrols. Sometimes you can walk right past them, sometimes you'll need to aggro them. With this particular patrol, I could probably get relatively close before they pull. We're just going to walk up and we're going to use Flash to grab them. And I'm going to show you, this is what it looks like if I don't mark the mobs at all. All of the DPS start attacking whatever the heck they want. The Black Mage is using AoEs. <laughs> the, um, the Monk is sitting here completely... Um, going to town on that scurvy dog. But I'm still holding aggro because Flash actually generates a lot of enmity. So despite all of the damage on these other mobs, I actually still have an aggro lead on all of them. Um, and it, it's really Flash's advantage. You'll notice that I can't do it forever. Flash requires 27 MP to use every time I use it, and I have a very limited mana pool, so it's not something you can overuse all the time. And sometimes you'll see like, after that fight, I'll probably want to wait for my MP to replenish before I pull these three guys. Because we'll probably need Flash once again in order to hold some of the aggro here. Because the Monk and the Black Mage both pull large amounts of enmity on single target for the Monk and AoE targets for the Black Mage, which is something that I need to be aware of as a tank. The healer, for the most part, won't be pulling much more aggro than the uh, Black Mage will most of the time. Um, unless uh, unless a lot of people are being tanked by other uh, enemies, and there has to be a lot of extra healing going down. If you pull too many enemies or something like that, then the healer's job will increase, and the amount of aggro they're generating will increase with it. So we're just going to walk up, and we're going to shield lob Captain Madison. Uh, we're going to mark the left reaver for no reason other than he's the left reaver, and the right reaver with the one and two, and then once those two are dead, it's assumed Captain Madison is number three. We'll walk up and use Flash a couple times. We're going to face the enemies away from the rest of the group, and we're even going to use our Rampart ability, which is once every 30 seconds, sorry, once every 90 seconds, we will have a, um, we will have an increase in the amount of damage we're taking, but sorry, a decrease in the amount of damage we're taking, an increase in our defense. We can also use Convalescence, which increases our healing. It's another ability that we will have as a low-level uh, gladiator at this point. So you'll see the Scholar is starting to creep up a little bit on this other guy. But I switched over to them in time, and then Captain Madison will be the last at the end. My monk has decided to go uh, and pull as hard as it possibly can on Captain Madison. So we're going to use a few flashes to try to catch back up since it generates more aggro faster. We're out of MP now, so at this point, the monk has aggro. There's nothing we can do about it. Ideally, the monk will stop attacking. But that's entirely the prerogative. This is an item we need. It's entire, entirely the prerogative of the other person. Sometimes the DPS is not going to want to let you tank, especially in these lower dungeons. There's nothing wrong with losing aggro. It's just the way that the game is designed. If somebody is a higher level, with much higher level item um, uh, equipment, and has a DPS class, especially if they go off target when there's a large group of mobs, if they want that, that enemy, they can probably get them over a period of time. <laughs> what I would be doing with an ethereal bra brass dagger, I'll show you what I would do, um, although for the, durate, for the purposes of the rest of this fight, I'm going to use my standard item. The ethereal brass dagger is treated as a high quality item, so it gets a, a plus one physical damage bonus over the dagger I currently have equipped, which is in this menu right here. This is currently the dagger we have, two strength, one vitality, two skill speed. This gives me an extra vitality point, the, sta the same skill speed, some parry, and critical hit. The uh, extra stats make it imp more impressive than the rest of it, um, the, the, than the standard store-bought item. And this is definitely something that we would want to be equipping. Now, because I want to do the dungeon the rest of the way normally, I'm not actually going to leave it equipped. But we can equip it 
during the middle of the dungeon, and upgrading your gear mid-dungeon is fine and expected, generally, if you just rolled need on something that uh, improves the stats for the items in your class. We're going to keep using the normal brass dagger, though, for the duration of this, and with any other gear upgrades we find, because I want to keep this whole, um, assuming you don't get lucky and get extra drops that help you out with aggro control and similar concepts. Um, over here, we have three more enemies. If we look around the corner, there's two enemies back here. You can also run around and engage these two enemies and avoid these three entirely. And I'll show how to do that right after we kill these three. You'll notice we can go around here without really drawing any undue attention. I'm going to come up because this guy has a bow, and that means that he's going to be a little reluctant to come down to face us. Ranged enemies won't pull quite as neatly as uh, melee enemies do. And we'll just attack these enemies like the standard. I will use several flashes to hold large groups, large amounts of aggro. You'll notice that even the third number, who I switched over here, um, was about to be lost to Black Mage aggro. So we can use extra flashes to get that, or we can t uh, tab over and use Fast Blade Savage Blade combos to generate additional aggro. If you're having a particularly hard time, you can also even ask your uh, your teammates, your party members, to uh, wait a couple rounds before they start attacking. Like, if you can wait until I flashed once or twice and then begin attacking, that can help you maintain an aggro lead. Um, although ultimately, it's up to your party members uh, whether or not they want to do, uh, uh, want to actually uh, listen to you. So there's more enemies. We'll come back down here. Combo again. Fast Blade, Savage Blade, Fast Blade, Savage Blade. It's a one-two combo. The Savage Blade does more damage. I can Fast Blade on this target, go over here, and Savage Blade on the other one. And that gives me a much larger aggro lead uh, on the second target that I was using than it was on the first. You can actually, once you have your three-hit combo, you can actually use all three hits on three different targets. And distributing the damage that way is frequently one of the better ways of maintaining control. In this room back here, there are two random mobs. You can choose to kill these, or you can choose to skip them. They are entirely hidden back in this room. They will never come back and haunt you again if you decide to skip them. So this time, we're going to skip them. If we look on our right over here, if we check our map, our mini-map, or our actual map, if we hit M, we can see an actual map, and you can see where all the side chambers are. Each of these side chambers is going to contain extra enemies and per uh, perhaps extra loot as well. So if we go down the side and up over here, we will see that there's two more enemies back here. Um, just to show you that it doesn't matter whether you attack them or not, we're actually going to attack these guys. There's no reason to do so, but there's no reason not to either. We will pull using Shield Lob. That pulls this melee opponent into range. A flash. There we go. Pulls the enemy into range of flash. The black mage is a little fast on the cast there, so the black mage will probably end up taking the mob. Rather than trying to pull this mob off of the other people, I'm going to switch over to the second mob. Because they took that mob from me, sometimes it's better to focus on the next mob ahead of you rather than focusing on the same mob that you've marked as one. As long as they're not going to kill that DPS, you could use that extra time to gain a greater advantage on everybody else and therefore have a safer rest of the fight. If you kite the right wall over here, you'll notice that these two guys are facing away from you. You can actually even walk up behind this treasure chest. If you just kind of inch up on it, you can loot the treasure chest and get the items without actually having to fight these guys at all. If you just exit on the same wall that you entered on, and then you can turn around to leave without ever fighting them. Um, there will be several uh, chests in the game that you can do this with. This is just an example of one of them. You can also frequently use jumping to get you to places where walking around would have taken you much longer to get to. Jumping does, in fact, scale geometry in this game. Not all of it, but a lot of it. This reaver and this dog standing in front of them are things that we need to kill. So we're going to walk up on them, and we're just going to use Flash. No shield bob that time. Wasn't required. 
we could have done it if we wanted. Wouldn't have really made any difference, except for our one marker would have been held a little bit stronger up until the point where we first flashed. They're both melee, so we don't have to worry about grouping them in any special way. We will naturally group together with Super Flash. They dropped an interactable object right here that uh, my Black Mage just picked up. And it will update your... Um, uh, it will update... Well, actually, it didn't update. It generally updates your 2D Finder over here about what you need to do next. Right now, our current goal is to obtain the, the Wave Rider Gate Key. The most recent thing we did was discover the Pirate Captain. We fought him. He had the two sailors on either side. Um, in this area up here, I think this is a relatively unique event, uh, event as far as the actual thing goes. Get them Gropers off the Grog. This is a bar fight. I think this is one of the only times in the entire game where the enemies will actually be attacking each other. You can walk up and just grab this treasure chest, too. Uh, it gave us an item this time. This is a uh, Ethereal Hard Leather Boots. This is a caster item, as denoted by the intelligence and, uh, and mind uh, stats that it has on it. We can just hit pass on this. This isn't an item for us. So as they continue to attack, you'll notice one of them, I think it's this guy, is utilizing a cure spell to keep as many of them up as possible. Yeah, he's channeling cure. So the cure spell is going up. If you had a stun or a silence, while cure was channeling, uh, you could go ahead and use that. If we interrupted this group, it would be a very large fight on our hands. There's Cure again. If we interrupted the, gr the, the group, it would be a very large fight on our hands. There are, let's see, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six enemies in that group. Yeah, there's six enemies in that group as a non... Um, the, uh, that is not really a, a number that you would want to engage with relatively low gear. In higher gear levels, or perhaps without the healer, it would be much easier to do. We're just going to ignore them. If you wanted experience, you get a lot of experience by killing enemies, though. So if you wanted experience and you had a good group, um, make sure that you, you watch and you mark the, uh, the healer first. Uh, there's another key over here. There's a key to the hole. An interactable object. I'm going to tell my group to ignore that object and to focus on group 1 and 2. We're going to start off with a shield lob and then we're going to go into a flash. One of them is ranged and one of them is melee. And if I click the key to the hole here, then my interacting menu starts appearing. But you'll notice that any time I take damage, that gets interrupted. Other, other group members can still attack the... Uh, other group members can still pick up the item, but if you're being attacked at the time, either from a marked AoE ground attack, or from a uh, from auto attacks, like I'm currently being attacked as the tank, then that's going to interrupt you and prevent you from uh, accomplishing a lot of interactable goals. And then you just right click and you unlock in order to unlock the doors. Generally unlocking things will be the tank's responsibility. Uh, as a tank, you're responsible for setting the pace of a dungeon. So you're, you will generally be the first people pulling. This is actually an upgrade I'm going to use. This upgrade is an ethereal bronze plate belt. If you remember pr me previously, I was saying that there are no belts that are sold. that are sold by the basic vendors that give you the gladiator, marauder, paladin, warrior outlook. That gives the high defense value of a tank belt. This is a tank belt. We're going to hit need on it. And whenever everybody else finishes rolling on it, we're going to go ahead and equip it. We're going to open up our, our, our armory, we're going to go into our belt section, we're going to just right-click and equip our ethereal plate belt. The hard leather hunting belt is going to be replaced by it. We're good to go. We could have bought one on the market board, but I wanted to show um, a way that you could do, just by interacting with NPC vendors, I uh, wanted to, to show a way that you could equip a bunch of gear. Going up here, we have two enemies standing in front of another gate, the captain's quarters in this case. We're going to mark the left and the right. If you'll recall... Earlier, the key to the captain quarters dropped from the, the enemies that were standing right here. The one enemy and the, uh, and the dog, the scurvy dog. So we're going to shield lob an opening, and then we're going to flash. We're going to flash three times. Three seems like a nice round number for flashing. Anytime you're generating AoE hate using flash, you are really outpacing everybody else in your group. So when we go over here, you'll notice that there's not really any uh, aggro already established here, and this enemy is resisting having other people build aggro on them as fast as they would if I had just been using my combo. 
Flash is roughly the ability, the same, it's roughly the equivalent of a 500 potency attack on everybody within melee range of you, as far as aggro generation goes. By right-clicking and saying, okay, it opens the thing. This is the Shallow Tail Reaver. He's going to have an, another marked AoE ground attack. Him and the boss are the only two in the dungeon who are going to have attacks like this. I really want to hold aggro on him. I do not want to lose aggro. He has one of the hardest hitting attacks percentage health base in the entire game. We're even going to use our Rampart ability and our Convalescence ability. This monk having them is not really a wonderful idea. It's something that should definitely worry me as a tank. Because if he used his overpower ability and hit any of these other uh, people along with me, it would have killed them. Which means if they aren't good at dodging, and they are good at pulling aggro, this is easily going to be one of the first places in the game you're going to see a dead party member. Marked attack one, marked attack two, pulling one with a shield lob, getting them in melee range, using flash. This is very rote and repetitive at this point. This is the standard way we'll be holding aggro. The best way to hold aggro is to be mashing your buttons. You don't want to be... Um, you don't want to be having any downtime. I've had a lot of downtime so far in this dungeon when I was... I've had a lot of downtime in this dungeon when I was handling... Uh, describing things rather than actually fighting them. Which has given a lot of opportunities for the Black Mage, the Monk, and the Scholar to catch up with me. We got the Wave Rider key from the uh, person who is... Uh, the, from the Marauder who is in the Captain's Quarters. So we'll go ahead and open the gate and we'll just head down here. This is just a long walk to the boss room. When a boss room is sealed, it seals along this purple line right here. I think that's a purple line. It might be blue. When a boss fight is sealed, it's sealed along this line right here, which means crossing this line means you're ready to begin the fight. Generally, as a tank, you want to be the last person to cross the line and the first person to pull. That guarantees that everybody else is something is known to be ready at the time where you cross and is known to be ready for you to pull. I generally, when I cross, I turn around to make sure everybody else is inside. I will mark the enemies. I will take a few more steps forward, or I will say, are you guys ready to pull? And once everybody is over the line, it's safe to pull. Without any communication, that is pretty much a 100% guaranteed way that you can always pull aggro safely on a boss. After the 15 seconds of uh, passes, a seal will form preventing access in, uh, towards that destination. So in this case, a large gate lowers, and it says the area has been sealed. As we attack the two reavers along the side of Captain Madison here, And then Captain Madison himself. Eventually, at some point, these dogs in the back will, will, uh, will be made. We're going to use Fight or Flight to generate more aggro. Fight or Flight is actually best used at the very beginning of a fight to generate a lead so that you never lose aggro in the first place. But the Black Mage is deciding to contest us a little bit with them. So, we'll need to do everything we can. We will continue to, to use our standard attacks group near the healer. The healer will almost always grab this aggro. When all of the dogs collect, we start using flash, as much flash as we can, in order to make sure that we're holding everything as firmly as possible. Captain Madison will flee when he hits a certain hit point barrier, and then we just need to kill the rest of these dogs in order to finish the fight. Treasure Coffer has been left behind. The Rope Belt, which is an item for other casters. We're going to pass on it since we don't need it. I can use this time to note that it is currently in Eorzean time, which is the game world's time. It is currently 11.48 a.m. This is the outside of the arena, and if, it's, if it was nighttime right now, and not almost noon, then you would actually see like a starry sky on the background instead of a, a, a noon time sky. If it was a sunset, if we hung around here for another 10 or 20 minutes, uh, we could actually watch the sunset inside the dungeon, which I think is a really cool attention to detail that this game offers. Our signs will be located once again on our enemies. 
we zoom out a little bit, we can see that there are, in fact, two lines coming off of this. One line is going to the scurvy dog, and one line is going to this reaver in the back. This is going to be our primary target. We can spin our camera around and notice that he has a bow on his back. That means he's going to be one of the ranged enemies. So we'll open up with a uh, shield lob on him, quickly close the distance between ourselves and him after the shield lob, and then the melee people will join us and we will flash. He won't approach me because he has a bow and I'm within range. So it's up to me to approach the melees like the dog and the uh, axe-wielding Shallowtail Reaver. You can also use the names to determine who has it. The Shallow Eye Reaver, who is holding a bow, will be using his bow weapon. Shallow Tail Reaver, who is using an axe, will be using an axe weapon. Um, so any shallow, shallow Claw will be using his fists most often. I think that's a, I think that's a male. Can't tell from here. Subligar makes it difficult. Shallow Eye is probably going to be using a bow further out. Shallow Scale that actually might be a uh, a lancer. You see two little lines coming off. One is going to the Shallow Eye. One is going to the Shallow Scale. Now we can actually ignore all of the enemies on this on the right side of this area. And they're generally ignored unless they're being cleared for experience. I'm going to go ahead and mark uh, one, two, and I can't click Shadow Scale Reaver because he's behind that pillar. But if I move my camera around, I might be able to manage it. There we go. I'll do it there. I I won't be able to click him. I won't be able to click him from where I'm currently standing and where my camera is currently set up. But if you move your camera around so that things are, are visible to you, you can then click on them. Line of sight will generally work like that as far as selecting enemies goes. I will shield lob this enemy, but we know this enemy is going to be melee. And we know that enemy is probably going to be melee. And we know this one's going to be ranged. So I'm going to shield lob this enemy, which is the closest enemy to me, but I'm going to run to the shallow eye and meet him halfway so that the other melee will join me. And then I can flash the eye, the claw, and the scale at the same time. A little bit of planning ahead on pulls like this makes everything go much more smoothly than they might otherwise go. And then we'll flash a couple times and start just dealing damage as normal. The Shallow Scale Reaver, it looks like, is actually using a uh, is actually a gladiator modeled enemy. So they have a sword and shield, so they're modeled off, modeled off the gladiator classes. You'll see most of the enemies in game, there's a brown targeted AoE. You'll see most of the enemies in game are actually being marked off on as a uh, Uh, with a similar skill set as the characters that we can play, as the classes that we can play. Most of the humanoid enemies, I should say. So here, we're just going to wait until he circles around right next to everybody, gets everybody within flash range, and then we're just going to sneak up and flash them all. And we'll flash them all several times until we have full, uh, full aggro control. In the last fight, uh, if we cross this threshold, this is a boss threshold, so if we cross this threshold, we'll probably end up with a fight. Uh, but we'll also have a cutscene on our hands, and it's kind of impolite to activate a cutscene while you're in the middle of combat. Well, people will go in, uh, invulnerable for the period of time. Anybody who skips the cutscene will no longer be invulnerable, and there's not really a way to tell if anybody else has skipped the cutscene. So if it's activated prematurely, like so, then it's hard to tell if you have lost aggro as the invulnerable tank during the cutscene. The cutscene will introduce the boss, and then we'll go in for our boss fight. Some story dungeons will have more story, some will have less story. And we see that, in our absence, the, uh, the last of the Reavers has been killed. There will be several areas here, several marks. We will mark them each with a different geometric symbol. Just because there's four geometric symbols and there's four pieces. This is the way that you would communicate to your team. Like, I will get square and circle. Or, I will get the cross. Or, I will get the triangle. You could also number them if you wanted. 
but numbers may also be required later on during the fight in order to mark mobs for priority. Because what happens is, halfway through this fight, or so, these little gates start rippling. When they get little bubbling jets of water popping up, then if you right-click them as an interactable object, then you will seal the gates against the intruder who is trying to get in. If they remain unclicked, then they will spawn an additional addict who will come and attack you. I'm communicating to my party that I actually want, for in, in instructional purposes, I want the triangle ads to spawn. Uh, I would like the um, the circle ads, the square ads, and the cross ads to not be spawned in the meantime. Uh, you, you can actually see that our, our uh, uh, various party members have each picked their own. Sil is standing next to a natural, Ren is standing next to the circle, oh, sorry, the cross and uh, Arya standing next to the square, which means the triangle would be left for me. Now there's a way to do this as the tank. If we have Shield Bash, which we have at level 18, but you probably won't have when you're first doing the dungeon. Um, if we use Shield Bash, we can Shield Bash the enemy and then immediately go and open the unnatural ripples. We can also kite him back and forth just by having him run behind us since he's a melee uh, range enemy. <laughs> And we can probably get within range of the unnatural ripples and hit the button before he actually catches up to us and, and auto-attacks us to prevent us from doing it. But we're actually going to intentionally spawn the enemies this time in order to show what the ads look like. They're pretty squishy and they go, to, they go down fast. So I'm going to just pull, walk up, shield lob this mob, and I'm going to come stand by the area that I know the ads are going to spawn. I'm actually going to position a little bit further away. The disease applied by the scholar is slowing him down, so he won't be able to keep up with me very well. This unnatural ripples a triangle is something that I would want to click. I would just walk over and try to right click it. And I could have done it just fine. But I want the enemy to spawn so you can see what the enemy has looked like. This is a Baleen guard. I'm going to walk up and just attack it a couple times. I don't want it going after the healer. And then we'll flash it. Some groups might want to ignore these ads. Some groups might want to kill these ads. I'm going to mark this as a target to attack. There's another one. I'm going to use flash to gather the next one. There's another one over here. I'm going to use flash to gather him. And I've lost the boss, as no noted by the different symbol that's changed. I'm going to ask for a limit break. And I'm going to group all of the ads. There we go. That's the caster limit break. It deals AoE damage. So it just dealt a lot of damage to the other adds and allows them to die easier. Of course, the, the main enemy going down will end the fight. So if there's still an add up, he will just despawn at the end of the fight. And that's the basics of tanking in the dungeon Sastasha, the first dungeon in Final Fantasy XIV. Thank you for showing up and staying for Better Take a Dungeon. Our duty is complete. The run is complete. The only thing left to do is to commend people if we have entered this dungeon in a solo queue. A player commendation option will be available in the bottom right, and loot the treasure chest at the end. Don't forget to thank your other party members, um, especially if they've done particularly nice things, and a kind word goes a long way. Uh, greed, need, or pass on this item. This is actually a Disciple of War item for monks, dragoons, and archers, so I'm going to pass once again. And we can wave our farewells. and say our goodbyes. Take care, I'll see you guys next time.